Hey, buddies, Potato McWhiskey here and welcome back to Victoria 3. I apologize if my voice is a little bit crackly, a little bit painful. This is the fifth episode I have recorded in a row because goddamn do I love this game that much. I'm also a little bit sick, so you will just have to live with that. Unfortunate for you, unlucky. However, not unlucky for me because I get to play Japan today and we've been making amazing progress. We have a government administration coming up. We have a huge amount of technology coming in and it is long overdue that we start to build a military. We're going to build two shipyards in our capital city. These shipyards will be set to military shipbuilding. Wait, let me do the math in my head. I need 30. Actually, I need to build three shipyards. Yes, I need to build three shipyards because I'm going to be consuming um, a lot of the man of wars and they produce 15 per level. So that would be 45 versus 40. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So let's get these um, naval bases under construction in Kansai. Uh, we have to get the naval, the Navy under construction early so that, because it takes a long time to train a Navy, right? So we need to get the Navy under construction long before we start doing any adventures overseas. Um, another thing that we're going to want to consider doing is starting to upgrade um, some of our production things, like in development, uh, moving to cargo ports. This is going to massively strain our government um, coffers because we have to buy these clippers ourselves. Now, we don't have to convert everything. We can start converting some stuff towards producing more convoys because in order to sustain an army abroad, we're going to need convoys. That's right. We're suffering a little bit of tax waste. Let's go ahead and get like two more government administration just to get rid of that tax waste. I should really be like mass building government administration so that I can um, start, you know, upgrading my institutions. But, you know, we got, we got a lot of things to do. Basically, maybe I would do that if I was able to get per capita taxation, which is potentially something we will look into doing after we have enacted the dedicated police force. Because maybe this time the shogunate won't be so revolutionary and so radical in opposition to changing the taxation system. Oh God, look at that graph go up. We're going to stunt this graph so hard. Oh, Knights of the Waves. Oh, Jesus. Looks like we got a, uh, we got a tsunami, a really bad one. This is going to give basically 10 devastation. Yikes. Cross my country. Yikes! Devastation increases more mortality, it increases, it decreases migration attraction and decreases infrastructure. That's a pretty bad event. An eruption. There has been also been an eruption as well. So we could help out the Dutch East Indies at a cost of cash or we could just not care. This will increase our infamy and you know what? We haven't been spending our infamy at all so I'm happy to let myself build up a little bit of infamy because it's bleeding away at a reasonable rate. Um, we can check our infamy by going to our diplomacy. You can see our reputation is fairly reputable. We haven't been doing any expansionist stuff yet oh my god look at the capitalists working in my gold mines they have lavish living standard they're making so much money these guys are so rich so insanely impossibly rich it's insane holy crap that must give them like crazy political power yeah it does 400k political power god damn uh dedicated police force has been passed that is a huge step forward for us because again this slowly begins to continues the erosion of the political power of the shogunate um and more importantly it also is just I think dedicated police force is like slightly better, right? Less radicals, less state penalties. We are going to want to maybe upgrade our police force to the maximum level. That'll be something we, we build this up over time. We're going to build up the bureaucracy. Uh, okay, there has been whatever a volcano exploded here. It is causing issues. Yeah, we're going to spend some money. We're going to increase taxes to compensate for the extra expenditure that we're doing. We are now officially in credit, right? So now we're paying interest on loans. Um, but I, I like to live on the on the edge here. I like to live on the edge between credit and positive because that means the maximum amount of cash has been injected into my economy. So now that we have a robust enough economy to do this and we have a little bit of uh, tax overhead, I can kind of bounce around on my tax rates a little bit. I wasn't able to do that earlier in the game. So we're in an election and the Constitutional Reform Party is having trouble getting their expenses. I need the Constitutional Reform Party to have like a lot of momentum. And unfortunately, they do not. It looks like the Imperial Rule Party is just generating so much votes. Well, I mean, I've gotten away with a lot of liberal reform, so we'll see how she goes. Dialectics has been unlocked. There's the maximum education possibilities. Egalitarian is next. This will unlock some Im really important stuff, actually. The Progressive Party, universal suffrage, multiculturalism, proportional taxation, human rights, all these things start coming down the pipeline. Okay, the government has been reformed. What happens if I kick the samurai out? Oh, we would gain some legitimacy. Let's do that. How are the trade union coming? Yeah, they're very, very slowly building up power. It'll take them a long time before they're ever anywhere. Okay, so the shoguns will get radicalized from this. What's the current status of the shoguns right now? Yeah, they're a little bit upset from recent law changes, so we just have to let them cool off. If you try to change your country's laws too much all at once, your political parties will radicalize. One problem I have is these guys actually technically won the election. Although, that said, maybe their result on this election was worse than their previous one. 
So it actually was a net benefit for the Constitutional Reform Party. So the price of luxury uh, clothing has started to rapidly decline with the construction of these uh, clothing factories. And we started to see the price of clothing factories themselves start to decline. Grain, all this sort of stuff is super expensive. But I'm going to do a little bit of a detour to build up a military. One tech that I actually need is... Um, is it rifling that I need? Let me check my arms industries real quick. Yeah, I need rifling technology. So I'm going to... Start researching percussion cap, because that will lead me towards rifling. Oh, there's the Krakatoa eruption. Aftermath of the volcano is affecting the world's climate. Ah, okay. So that's what that was. I see, I see. Looks like the Aboriginals are having uh, an uprising. Aboriginal uprising. Cool, cool, cool. Or the Ab is it Aborigines? I don't know how, what the plural of that is. It's Aboriginal is the adjective, I think. So I don't think you would put an S on the end of that. The Aboriginals maybe sounds a little bit, I don't know, chauvinistic. Taking a look at our monthly market report, uh, the price of luxury furniture has stayed fairly stable, actually increased as people have more purchasing power. They're demanding these goods more. So that's the effect of lowering the cost of luxury clothing. People will start to purchase other things um, in higher quantities. Right, so we have built our very first uh, naval base and they are starting to finish now these take a very very long time to employ whereas most companies they can like hire per week about 10 percent of their needed staff because there's just a whole bunch of peasants hanging around sailors they need to be trained they take a while to build up a navy right we're um here it is there's the training rate right we can train a few sailors per week so it's going to take us quite a while to build up this. Uh, also, we have zero man of wars um, in our economy right now, or else we're producing a lot of them. It's just our consumption is really low. Yeah. So our consumption will slowly scale up to our need as time goes on. However, this will begin to burden the national coffers. This will become an expense. We can get away with a basic flotilla here for quite a while, because I'm pretty sure a lot of these countries like Dainam, they have zero navy. So we should be able to invade these guys. What is their relations? They have a defensive pact with... Selangor. Who is Selangor? So that's this tiny little nation here. So these guys don't basically don't have a navy, so we should have freedom of the seas. And as long as we have about a hundred highly trained battalions, we should be able to invade them pretty easily. Um, and once we invade them, we'll turn them into a vassal. Um, there is a particular type of vassal we can do. This right here. Uh, if a country is your vassal, they are forced to pay you 15% of their treasury and they have to join your war. So it'll be a by proxy way to control this land. We don't have to control it directly, thus build it up ourselves. They'll continue to build it up themselves, we'll just siphon off some of their treasury, thus making us more powerful, having more cash at our disposal. And so with the completion of these shipyards as well, let us go ahead and for every arms industry we build, click, we will build one, two, uh, two, 25 barracks. Now the cool thing is because we're going to be paying the wages of those soldiers, they will actually increase the demand for goods. I'm going to go ahead and lower taxes uh, a little bit for a little while because we have a nice buildup of gold reserves. We'll slowly burn those away over the next year. Now it would be technically cheaper to house these barracks in different countries because the wages in my capital are actually higher in other spots, but I'm going to just, I'm just going to build them here because I don't care. So it's going to take us quite a while to get through this construction tree. Let's have a look. How many weeks? Uh, yeah, so it's going to take roughly two years to get through this construction queue. What we could do is go up to a higher tax rate or maybe put a tax on luxury clothes, go to a higher tax rate and build a slightly bigger construction sector countrywide. It takes about a year for a construction sector to quote unquote pay itself off in terms of its construction output. Yeah, let's go ahead and re revise the asylum system. That'll increase the quality of life of some of my population. It'll cost me a little bit of money, but that money um, is well spent, in my opinion. Quality of life is the ultimate goal. We want to maximize our quality of life for our people. So yeah, we're burning away more of our national balance in the name of construction. But my hope is that this construction will mean that we'll get through this whole uh, construction queue a lot quicker shave a few weeks off, you know? So yeah, they're training about 60 men a week into this flotilla, which means they're going to be able to train, what, every 10 weeks is 600? Every year is 3,000? So it's going to take many, many years for these navies to be built. So you can have to build them early. Oh, we have a native uprising. Is this in Africa? Nobody is interested in getting involved because we haven't made any enemies yet. So we will just mobilize someone. Let's recruit a general. Somebody basic. You're from the samurai. You're from the peasants. I'll do a peasant general. Hell yeah, let's do that. And we will mobilize this peasant general and put him on this front line. And he should be able to win this very, very easily. It's not a real war. It's just kind of like a, you know, native uprising type situation. This African land will be very, very useful to us. Um, it can produce certain things that we can't in Japan. Mostly it produces things that we can already make. But theoretically, it'll be a really, really powerful source of population and all this sort of stuff uh, in the long term. 
GDP, baby. The more GDP, the better. There's also, I believe there's discoverable resources in these regions. Yeah, you can find gold mines, you can find oil, you can find rubber, all sorts of really, really cool, delicious resources. Cool, there is percussion, percussion cap, which is a step. Reinforced wooden ships. Hmm, this could increase our clipper production. Not what we're looking for. We want rifling so that we can start producing rifles in our arms factories. It's just really a way to increase the productivity of arms factories. It's not, they're not, I don't think that really has a gameplay impact, that rifles. So here is the war um, in Kikuyu. Should be a fairly straightforward win here. Actually, believe it or not, it will not be. I will need to mobilize another army. Yes, our convoy requirement is a little bit too high. Let me just check my market. I have a surplus of convoys, which means I can safely come in to my development here and switch a couple of things over to cargo ports to have a little bit more in the way of cargo. Um, and then I should be able to mobilize another general. You know what? Mobilize them all. It'll take them a while to get there. Let me check. Oh, you know what? Let me, uh, let me stand them down. Yeesh. Okay, I still need a lot of convoys. I need another 500. Are we increasing our convoy capacity? Is that happening? It is slowly, slowly going up. So attrition will get a little bit better. The goods cost for military buildings is skyrocketing. Yikes. Uh, as we finish more arms industries, that'll become less of a problem. I think the problem I have right now is just guns are really, really expensive. Yeah, because we're not producing enough of them. But we are about to double the amount of goods, the gun, double the amount of guns that we are producing. How goes the war? It looks like we're just about to win as long as we get this battle. And then that should be a military victory for us. Yes, they are completely defeated and we will get to expand into Africa rather rapidly now. So you can see, as I finished an arms factory, the price of guns started to decrease. Now the price of the cost of guns for me is going to start increasing because I'm continuously buying more. I'm going to start that arms industry early, to be honest with you. Need to get them underway. Peace deal has been proposed. We will annex Kikuyu. Yoink. And the population and GDP of Japan now increases thanks to the fact that we are in control of a significant chunk of Africa, which I believe has completed the African colonies objective that we had. I think it would be important for me to try and get some Japanese people to move here, um, to lower the turmoil, and to have a local garrison of Japanese soldiers. In fact, there is actually a rather large Japanese population already living here, so that's quite handy for me. So as, a co as, a, as we centralize our military into the capital state, what we're going to do is to go ahead and disband the vast majority of the military around the country because we just don't need it. And there's a couple of reasons I'm doing this. I'm pretty sure your capital region can't join a revolt unless you switch sides on the revolt, which is something you can do, which means I'm always going to have full control of the professional military that exists in the capital. That is my hope. I don't know if that's actually a thing. We're kind of doing a little bit of experimental stuff here, but this will massively, massively lower the military wages cost not the goods cost. We're going for a very, very small, high quality military, about a hundred divisions of the, or are they battalions? I'm not sure. Um, but a hundred units of the highest quality that we can muster, right? So we're going to need mobile artillery. We're going to want bicycle messengers, machine gunners, uh, first aid. All these things are things we're going to start working towards. I think for now though, uh, line infantry plus mobile artillery should basically beat anyone in the world. Like, any of these nations here. Like these guys have 58 battalions and they're providing 98 power projection. That kind of tells me that while they're trying to have line infantry, they can't afford to sustain their line infantry. So my economic dominance should translate into a military dominance as well. So I think the shoguns have cooled off a little bit. Um, let's see, we have appointed bureaucrats. It would be good, honestly, it'd be really, really good if we could get rid of isolationism. Now, hang on, wait a minute. There is... The taxation capacity is kind of nice. But yes, I think we would want to maybe switch to even protectionism or mercantilism. Mercantilism is the less offensive change, I think. Yeah, there'll be less radical opposition to mercantilism. So let's reform to mercantilism. This will allow me to actually start trading with other countries. Navy's coming along nicely. We're up to five flotillas. It takes a very, very long time, right? We could train about three flotillas a year in here uh, because of the training rate. Now, eventually, I think we can change that. Um, we could upgrade the training rate a little bit later on in the game. But this is just like the most basic fleet um, imaginable. Beautiful. So we spent a lot of time working on this, um, but we now have almost 100 regular battalions with a power projection of nearly 300. We will be getting that power projection up. The second that we have rifling, we'll be able to switch over our arms manufacturing to a more efficient production method. We'll be able to switch to mobile artillery. You know, all that stuff will happen. Uh, and we have finished our building queue, which means... It is time for us to start considering what is the most efficient way to upgrade the production in my country. So there's a couple of buildings I need to like upgrade. The urban centers could be using market stalls 
So if I were able to increase my glass production by about 200, which I think I can do by making crystal glass, I would be able to significantly increase the economy of my country. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with making some lead mines. One, two, three, four lead mines. Let's make sure those lead mines are set up to use uh, a condensing engine pump, right? Let me double check the per level values. Yeah, that'd be 40. Um, and then once they are done, I'll be able to switch over my glass production. The other thing I need to do is I think I have expensive input goods for a lot of my industries that I need to like, take care of. See, so yeah, a hardwood is relatively expensive. How much of a deficit do we have? We have a deficit of 30. So I believe this logging cap is producing hardwood. So we're going to increase that by three. We're low on coal. How much coal is produced per level? That's 40. Is that true? I feel like it should be more. Mm, I have a tools deficit. I'm low on tools and steel. So let's make some tools and some steel. And then we'll make an extra, you know, couple of coal mines. So we've got our economy planned out for the next little while. That's going to cover us for a year worth of construction to try to improve the industrial part of our economy. Perfect. So here goes rifling. This is going to, oh, we also got patent stills, which is kind of interesting. But rifling is important because if we take a look at our buildings, in particular, the conscription center, if I switch to mobile artillery, it will use, sorry, not conscription centers, my barracks. It will use 100 artillery, okay, for an extra 300 army power projection. This is 15 offense, 15 defense, more morale damage, more kill rate, more provinces captured, right? It's going to cost me quite a lot. Um, so it uses 100 artillery. And now, if I go to my four arms factories and I switch to smooth bores, they will produce 100 more artillery, but this would lower the small arms, right? Unless I switch to rifles and rifles will make up for the difference. Not perfectly, mind you, but it will make up for the difference. So we'll switch around a little bit. This will massively negatively impact my productivity. But now we're using rifles. We modernize the arsenal. Arms industry throughput, migration attraction, or we can get tech. Let's go for tech. So now that we have a ton of power projection, right? If I go to my information tab here, our 100 regular battalions are giving us 600 power projection, right? From a single province. If we take a look at the potential diplomacy with some characters, like for example, let's say theoretically we were like, hey, you know, you should become my tributary. You can see because I have more power projection than Port Portugal, they're like, oh, maybe I should. Um, so power projection is important for aggressive diplomacy and also defensive diplomacy, just important for diplomacy. But we are now spending an inordinate amount of money on military goods, which means we need to deal with the economy. We need to get the economy chooching along, churning along. We have a little bit of gold reserves that we can sit back on for a little while. So let me have a look here. Siam has a de defensive pact with you. So I think I can start a diplomatic play. Ah, first I need to declare interests in Indochina. There we go. And then I'll maybe be able to make a diplomatic play to make someone my vassal. I think I think you have to have an interest active for a month before you can do something. Also, I can also establish colonies here. Yeah, we'll start colonizing. If we can get a significant chunk of Eastern Africa, that would put us in an amazing, amazing position um, for having a near global empire. I think we mostly want to control like this side of the Pacific, a good bit of Oceania, and then like as much of Eastern Africa as we can so that we're kind of like a reverse UK. We won't really be able to break into Europe. We could potentially try. You know, it's all, everything's on the cards. Brilliant. The first lead mines have been completed. And so we can come in here to the glassworks and start consuming just a little bit of lead at first. Not much, just a little bit of lead. So you might be surprised to find that even though I was massively investing in my military, that actually had a positive effect on my GDP. Like my GDP is still continuing to increase despite the fact that I'm burning a huge amount of cash on my military. I'm going to temporarily go up to a high tax rate or yeah, temporarily go up to a high tax rate. It'll hurt my country on a short term basis, but I don't like to go into massive credit because you can get into an interest spiral and then not be able to get out of it. Fruit's a little bit expensive, which is potentially time for us to maybe look into developing some of our colonies here. They don't have too many peasants available. What's the deficit for fruit right now? The deficit for fruit is enough to maybe support three plantations. So I think it would be quite good if I built three in my Oceania colonies, as this would increase their GDP, increase their quality of life. And I'm finally like getting something out of this land that I've taken, which is notably a, a good supply of fruit. There's egalitarianism. We could go to multiculturalism if we wanted to, although that'll be, that'll take, politically, that'll take a while. We can get to work on the labor movement. This will unlock some new political parties as well as leading to socialism and new laws with, to do with child labor. Speaking of child labor, those kids need to get to work on those mines. No, I'm just kidding. We need to, we, ideally we would get down to restricted child labor, and, but we have to have labor movement first. And the advantage of this is it will lower the mortality of these people so they will increase their population more. But more importantly, it will, um, Lower the dependent income, which 
is not great, but increasing the max education institution. We probably want to keep child labor for a while because there's actually a decent amount of money made from dependents. Those children are the lifeblood of the economy. I hate to say it, but they actually do serve a, a, an important function in this economy right now. Later on, we do want to have, obviously, we don't want children working because it's an inefficient use of human capital, right? Human capital is best educated, well supplied, so on and so forth. And the game models that, I feel like, pretty well. Silk, we have a deficit of about 50 silk. Let's build three more silk plantations to make up for that deficit. We still got a little bit of a hardwood deficit. I think I'm building the stuff to deal with that. Glass is in a slight deficit. How's lead? Lead, I have a relatively large surplus, so I think now I should be safe to go to a higher lead consumption. This will massively increase the price of lead. Yes, I understand. To a level that the market can't bear, but that will also increase the rate at which lead mines are producing lead because now they're more profitable. Kickstarting the... Kickstarting the economy it takes a bit of work, but... Once you have an economy ticking over, you can more easily absorb industrial expansion. So one thing that's happened to me is cloth and food has become incredibly expensive um, to the tune of a deficit of about a thousand food and 400 cloth. What's the current status of fertilizer? Fertilizer is relatively cheap and I'm pretty sure a single livestock ranch produces 10 fertilizer, which can supply a rice farm. Wheat farms use five, rice farms use 10. Millet farms, which I think are what are built in Africa. You have a little think about that. How much do you use? So use five as well. So rice farms are relatively inefficient when it comes to fertilizer. So the population of Hokkaido has actually massively increased, incredibly. Been huge migration here. I may opt to now take off the migration thing. The gold mines have attracted a huge amount of people. Yeah, I think I'm gonna go ahead, go to my decrees, disable greener grass, because we no longer need it here, because we have the population to work the gold mines, which was the main goal of getting Hokkaido populated. However, beautifully, Hokkaido is a great source of wheat. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five cattle ranches, and then Hokkaido should be able to then supply 10 wheat farms. These wheat farms will produce, how much grain per level? 30 grains, so that's 300. So that's the beginning of taking a chip out of this grain cost. So let's start making some vassals. Dynam, you will be our very first target. I think you're already involved in a thing. Cambodia may side with the enemy, but I think I'm strong enough to do this. I don't think anyone has a military economy that rivals mine. Like if I look around, I don't think I see a single arms industry in their entire country. Yeah, no, I, they, I don't think they can supply their barracks. Yeah, they've got mostly irregular infantry. I guess they technically have like some, but they have shortages. Yeah, they have some line infantry. Um, let's have a look at the diplomatic play. So now that this is actually a little bit more important of a diplomatic play, it's finally time that I talked about diplomatic plays. Basically, this is, there's three phases to a diplomatic uh, play. There's, I think it's opening, escalation, and then something else. There will be a variety of countries around that may weigh in either side of the conflict depending on their needs and desires and what they might target you for and you can sway them by offering them things so for example i could offer britain an obligation i could offer them to ban slavery right we could we could do all sorts of really cool things like we could offer britain hey do you want to conquer a piece of a country so their preference to support me is based on the ideological similarities of our government the cooperative attitude they have towards me the sympathy that they have towards me so sympathy i believe is just like a modifier that changes how the AI feels about the thing. But yeah, the UK is going to be neutral. Most countries are going to be neutral until like, you know, I start being a real threat and getting a vassal or two are going to be, is going to be really useful to making me a threat. So they're pretty fearful. This could actually work really well in my favor. They're pretty fearful. They're very pessimistic about the potential for the war here. This is mostly due to my military strength because I have such a strong military. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mobilize my entire military, all 100 battalions. Now this will cost me a lot of money. However, what it will do is it will hopefully drive home the fear and maybe they will capitulate and give me my war goals without me really needed to, to do anything. Now we could also chain this war to get a couple of extra vassals. Like we could vassalize Siam. I think though my focus is going to be to vassalize Dainam. That's an intact country. I might conquer Siam, but get a couple of vassals, build up our gold reserves. Yeah, we have nine fleets, they have none. I do really like how this game models that fleets are incredibly expensive and time consuming things to, to mobilize and like build up. You can't just flick a switch and get a fleet. Yes, 30% momentum to the Constitutional Reform Party would be amazing for this election. If we can keep that momentum going for the Constitutional Reform Party, we'll be able to change a lot of things in this country. We're currently trying to pass mercantilism and that seems to be going relatively well. We haven't met any major defeats or successes. It's just kind of like, it's going, you know, it's making its, it's making its way downtown. One thing worth considering is small arms are a little bit expensive. Why are small arms so expensive? Mm. 
Oh, 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 hello. They surrendered. They, they knew we were too powerful and they were just like, hey, listen, we're your vassal now. So my armies are demobilized. I, did, I actually missed it because I wasn't paying attention too much. But Dainam backed down in the diplomatic play, meaning I got the primary war goal without ever having to go to war. This is why you have a strong military, because you could be like, hey, you're my vassal. And people would be like, I don't want to be your vassal. And you're like, I got a really big military. And they're like, I guess we're your vassal now. <laughs> so that's just what happened here. And I don't know, can you actually build inside your vassal's territory? That's kind of an interesting idea. I don't think you can do that. But we do have interactions. Now, we're not going to be like an evil overlord. We're going to be friendly. We're going to improve our relations with them. They're a little bit upset with us because we forcibly vassalized them. Fair. Um, totally understandable. But what this will do for us will mean that we have a much larger population for, for us to sell goods to, and they also have a larger population of people to sell goods to. But also, uh, diplomatic pacts here, we are slurping up all of their cash flow. Nom, 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 nom. That's extra cash flow that we can use towards improving our own government. Um, so you could, you could probably see why I didn't rush straight to getting vassals, because it's, it's a big... The game is a big, complicated engine, right, that you're trying to guide very carefully. You're trying to coax it along down the tracks like it is, it is like a train. So I needed to build up my GDP and my economy before I could sustain a military that was capable of vassalizing a country without actually going to war. But I'm pretty sure this is the point where the GDP graph starts to go, like, omega vertical for us. Now, one of the downsides of having... Oh, shit, I need, I need to talk about markets now. Okay, so when we started the game, the only country inside our market was us. Now, if we take a look at our market, there's actually three countries inside of our market. Each of these countries is producing goods and all of our people are trading with each other. You can see here, um, like if we take a look at the... You can see here, you've got Peru, Bolivia and Argentina. These guys are in a customs union, which means they share a market, which means all goods and services are freely exchangeable between them. That is now also true between me and my vassals. So if I can really efficiently produce all of the goods that their people need to live, I can essentially siphon money away from their economies. Their people will have a really high quality of life, but they won't really produce anything themselves, which is problematic for them, the governments of these countries, because they won't have any real places to get tax revenue. And because it's not an actual trade agreement, they're not going to get any benefits from building trading posts, which is something we cannot do this game because we have yet to enact a policy that allows us to trade. So um, it's actually a big deal that these guys are inside my market. It should have actually, the second that they joined, it should have changed the price of many, many goods. So for example, grain went down in price because they still have serfdom. Fish went down in price. Um, wood went down in price. Tickets went up in price because I'm the only one making them. Cloth went down in price massively, which means I probably don't need as much cloth production. The services stayed roughly the same. Um, let's see, anything, anything change in price massively here? You could see the effects of me completely switching the glass industry over to um, <laughs> to glass to, to, to the uh, what you call it production to leaded glass production. Nothing too drastic here. Oil is still like omega cheap. Fertilizer got really cheap, which means I can expand my agriculture quite a bit. So this will having vassals inside my market will temporarily hurt my GDP, but it should, in theory, uh, in the long run, allow me to build it up. Jesus, GDP per capita here is like a pound a year. Um, so we need to get that up too. Um, Kyoto still has about 5 million peasants without jobs, so it would be a good idea to build this up. Ooh, the Constitutional Reform Party actually got a big loss in that election. Or else they didn't. Or else the Imperial Rule Party didn't win as hard? I actually can't tell. So clippers are actually quite cheap in my market, which means an efficient way to increase my economy might be to actually increase my fishing. And so I'm going to go to maximum fishing in Kyoto. Fishing wharves employ a decent number of people, right? Lots of shopkeepers, middle class, machinists, lower class, and um, laborers who are lower class. Oh, beautiful. So we have mercantilism. We can actually trade now. Huge. So we switched away from isolationism, which was giving us a ton of extra authority, which is now gone. So, you know, sadly, we'll have to make some changes there. We got rid of that nasty, nasty technology spread penalty. We are hurting our taxation capacity quite a bit. And it's kind of scary because we're at, we're at, DEFCON 5 tax limit. So we need to start increasing the revenue of the country. Um, but this is actually going to allow us to interact with the trade system. Say we have a deficit of clothing. We can import clothing from a market that has a surplus of clothing, or at least clothing that are cheaper than the ones that we have. So I'm going to start importing clothing from the French and British market. And I'm going to start exporting oil to whichever countries will pay the most for it. So like the French, the British, um, because I, I just, I have a huge surplus of oil that I can't trade, right? But now that I'm trading it, now oil is profitable. So now I can produce more oil and sell it to people. I also have a surplus of lead that I could sell to the Americans. And what this will do is open up these trade routes will increase the productivity of this resource, right? Either making it cheaper for your people to buy or 
making it more expensive and providing it to another market. But also, it will create a type of job. Where does the Trade Center job appear? I don't remember. Ah, there it is, Trade Center. So we have five Trade Centers in the Ryukyu Islands, and these are the thing that runs the trade route, right? Goods pass through here, they collect tariffs, they sell, they make money on the arbitrage. And this will employ people, most notably middle-class shopkeepers, who will become politically active in my country. So this is another way to push the political reform in the country that I want. It's opening up trade. It's a really, really important part of liberalizing the country to some extent. Um, so you can start to see, God, all these systems just interweave and interlock and you know. Um, unfortunately, though, I am over my authority limit, which is causing me some issues. And I think it is finally time to stop bolstering the intelligentsia. I cannot afford it anymore. So even though I stopped bolstering the industrialists and their political power fell, they did recover to a reasonable level. So we'll stop bolstering them. We'll let the political situation start to lay where it lies. Um, this is the year that Meiji Restoration happened, and we're a little bit behind, but we will get we will get around to it. Speaking of political reform, how about some tax reform, baby? This will radicalize the trade unions, but they're marginalized and nobody cares. So this will only slightly anger the shogunate, which I am totally on board with slightly angering people. Um, so let's do per capita taxation. Can I bring anyone into government who really wants per capita taxation? What about the samurai? This would lower my legitimacy, but an extra 7.5% chance to succeed? Seems worth it for the lowered legitimacy. The samurai and the industrialists are supporting that. That's great. Now that I'm strong, it might be time. Let's see. Have a look at Britain's um, power. What do they got? 1800 power projection, right? Compared to my meager 600. So they have three times the power projection of me. Let's see, is there anyone here who might be willing to make nice? Russia is not interested, although they are, do like my current power projection. I need to make friends with a great power. That's what I need to do. I need to make friends with one great power so that I can go to war with another great power to get recognition. Russia is probably not a good great power to get friends with. Let's start improving relations with Britain and see if maybe we can get the United Kingdom on our side. I think we may also have to finally accept that we're going to have to get rid of road maintenance in here in the capital city. It is 10% construction efficiency, but I think we just have to drop it now because we need to start getting our authority back. We don't have that much authority to play with. Most of it is being spent on consumption taxes to try to keep revenue high. I can lower taxes on a temporary basis to try to boost the economy, but I'll need to raise them back up in, you know, about a year. So we just need to massively increase the GDP, increase the velocity of money in my economy. And the money velocity in my economy is started to get faster. You can see that was the first tick up of industrialization. Then there was the next tick up. And pretty soon I'm going to start researching more industrialization technology. I think as soon as I get to mutual funds, that's when the industrialization explosion is going to begin. Um, speaking of innovation and research, we are not researching at maximum capacity. Let's, let's correct that and continue to expand these universities. I think two more universities will put me up my cap. Yes. So we'll get those universities really quickly. There's the labor movement, plus one minimum standard of living from literacy. Basically what this means is the more educated and literate my population is, the more they expect from life, right? And the more politically active they will become. So this unlocks a few laws that we might want to pass, like child labor, regulatory bodies, wage subsidies. This is all stuff. And it also leads to socialism, which is all kind of stuff that we might want to consider for the political revolution in Japan. So we could research human rights, What's the price of mutual funds? Mutual funds is down to 10K in price. That's a reasonable price. We'll get that in 23 months. And this is where the capitalist revolution will be going, my friends. Not the socialist one, the capitalist one. We might go socialist later, but at least on a temporary basis, we need to dilute the power of the aristocrats in this country. And one of the best ways to do that is to bring in some capitalists. Um, looks like there's some kind of battle going on here. And coal and there's a military revolt. I'm going to go ahead and declare neutrality. I have no interest in this diplomatic play. Then we have, let's see here, Siam is dealing with a Malay uprising. Now here's an interesting idea. What if I joined a side? What if the Malay uprising offered me a, well, I mean, if they offered me a piece of territory or something against Siam, I might join them. I'm letting them know that I'm leaning their way. But if they don't offer me something substantial, you know, I'm just not going to get involved. I got bigger fish to fry. Quite literally. We're going to start a whaling industry soon. I, I know whales are mammals, okay? There's got to be one guy in the comments like, actually, whales aren't fish, they're mammals. And I'm like, okay, guy. Yes, I did soy voice for someone objecting to something I said in a video, okay? What of it? So in terms of industrial goods, our tool production is relatively expensive. So I would like to build a few more tooling workshops. Um, every tooling workshop produces 80 tools, which is a three tooling workshops to take care of the deficit. One, two, three. And then... There's a little bit of a deficit of steel and I'm going to start building um, steel mills in my less populated regions because I the wage cost of some of these areas is just really, really high now for me. 
Uh, every steel mill produces 90 steel. Iron is a little bit expensive, so we'll maybe get an iron mine. Coal is a little expensive, we'll get another coal mine. Glass is a little bit expensive, so we'll get a glass works. How's the colonization going? It seems to be going quite well. Um, we don't have an interest in the Nile. Let's go ahead and start colonizing Maasai. We split our interests, but gather more territory. This is contributing significantly to the growth in our GDP and our population, because there's a ton of just really, really nice land that we're yoinking. Uh, the Netherlands has started to expand into Congo and stuff. Let's have a look. Johor, do I want to kill? What's your diplomatic situation? You've got an alliance and some defensive pacts with a bunch of people. Who could I conquer easily? Brunei. They're wary of me because they see me as a threat. They have an alliance with Belungan and a defensive pact with the Dutch East Indies. Ah, but Maguindano has no such protections. Perhaps we could conquer, do a little conquest here. They got 300k people, they got half a million GDP. That's pretty good. What do you got in terms of buildings? What are you doing down here? Let's have a little look. Logging camp, fishing wharves. Ooh, a really good agrarian economy. Hey, 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 hey. How do you guys feel about joining the Japanese empire? You got no people protecting you. Do I want to conquer this directly or do I want to spit it off into a country? Let's do a little conquest. First things first, let's declare an interest in Indonesia. Where else do we have an interest? Manchuria would probably be an interest of ours so that we can maybe conquer a state from Qing. Um, they're going to get very strong soon, so we might want to like kill them soon. Let me have a look. What's their... Yeah, they got battalions that are capable of really fighting now, so we'd need to get another tech level ahead of them, I think, before we could maybe take Manchuria. It's not a bad region, right? It's pretty good. Burma, what's your situation? Oh, damn, you got like a bunch of allies and stuff. <sighs> Labyrinthian legal system, mining accidents. Um, I'm not ready to get trade unions, so we'll just keep empowering the industrialist with that event. Let's have a look here. Oh, so we'll have Dynam on our side, which is good. Should make them pretty worried. So they are definitely fearful. Let's go ahead and switch to high taxes to build up the coffers before this war. Um, we'll need high taxes to mobilize our generals. So we could sway Spain to our side, interestingly enough. Offer them an obligation. I don't think I need Spain's system assistance in all honesty. I think I'm just going to go ahead and uh, mobilize all my generals, I guess. Boom. It'll be expensive, but the mobilization I think will be worth it if they decide to back down. Oh, escalation paused for five days. What have they done? They are attempting to sway Portugal. Well, now I can sway Spain. I would like Spain to respond. They're waiting a few days. What's going on? Okay, cool. Spain is now supporting my side, so the fear of God is in them. Now I could start at adding war goals. I could take a treaty port, right? I could take this. I could take Macau. That would really piss off Portugal. Bali. So who is Bali? Type into the map here. So Bali is a country here. Ooh, we could liberate Bali from Portugal. That would get the Portuguese a little bit scared. We take a look at the military situation. So things should be fine. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, offer Bali independence. So now they should start thinking about backing down, I think. I could add a couple more war goals. You know, I think taking a Portuguese treaty port in Macau would be a big old deal. If we can get it from the war, that just seems based because Spain is going to be helping me. And the cool thing is Spain and Portugal are neighbors, so they're going to like fight the hell out of each other. And Portugal's only got eight troops. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm getting their treaty port. Amazing. And this is a really really damn good treaty port, right? It's got 300,000 people. It'll allow me to trade with China without tariffs. Oh, Radical Dutch East Indies. Mm, Russia is managing the status quo. Yeah, Russia, of course you would. I'd like to start backing some revolutions in this area so that I can swoop in and become the leader. <laughs> Welcome to Victoria 2, baby. Welcome to imperialism. Imperialism the game. So we have a war with Maguin de Nau. Um, so I think I can rely on Spain to handle the Portuguese home front. And I will rely on my navy and my naval military and navy invasions to deal with the uh, current front. So we'll do a naval invasion of, uh, well, we definitely want to do Macau. How many local troops do they have here? Oh, not much, just a conscription center worth. Should be a fairly straightforward naval invasion. I'm going to declare neutrality in the diplomatic play here. Nobody wants to support the revolution, sadly. The revolution will live on in our hearts. Ooh, we have a shortage of input goods. That is not good, actually. Hold on. Um, for our military, which means we're suffering military penalties. We're not getting our full benefit of mobile artillery. Um, it's not too bad yet. Let's go ahead and build ourselves an arms industry. We're missing some steel and some coal. So let's get a steel mill and a coal mine as well. So where's this invasion force? 
I don't really... So basically you tell this guy to do a naval invasion. He prepares for a certain amount of days and then those troops get launched. Uh, meanwhile, most of my troops are just sitting in garrison in Japan in case someone tries to invade, invade me. It's unlikely, but it could happen. So my main goal is to get control of this treaty port and then to get control of Mindano. War exhaustion is good. How is the war in Portugal doing? Believe it or not, Portugal is winning. Unbelievably. Spain is just failing to shove but Spain or Spain should win this right they have the theoretically larger army they have the theoretically higher quality army they should win that so where's this naval invasion eight more days of pre preparation before it launches okay so oof 25% more radicals or 30% tax waste for two years dude I'm gonna deal with those radicals let me tell you listen I'll I'll take population radicalization, okay? I cannot I cannot have my tax income cut. Capitan. Okay, cool. So the invasion went off swimmingly. We managed to beat them. Uh, let's go ahead and launch another naval invasion of Min Danao using another general. I'll leave this general here guarding this uh, Macau. This should be a fairly straightforward invasion. I don't think they have many in the way of troops. Yeah, three battalions. Who asked? Dude. Okay, general staff has been unlocked. This will lead to skirmish infantry. Now, skirmish infantry are actually significantly better than regular infantry. If I go to my R buildings development barracks, you can see here skirmish infantry um, consume ammunition. However, they have more officers, which means more political power. Uh, they have an extra 10 offense and 5 defense um, and an extra 200 power projection. So we are eventually going to want to build ammunition for these guys. Uh, let's take a look at the ammunition factory. Munition plants. We'll need two munition plants, but that will require us to make explosives and more lead. That'll be a long uh, mid-term goal. Maybe in the mid-70s we'll be able to upgrade the skirmish infantry. Remember, we have to do a lot of catching up. We are now ninth in GDP in the world. Um, very quickly catching up to Great Britain, actually, believe it or not. So I think the invasion has gone on swimmingly. 70% occupied. They're losing. Spain. How are you losing, Spain? Oh my god, Siak is actually obliterating them. He is like the God defender general ever. <laughs> Spain cannot break this line because it's like this this dude is destroying Spain. Um, let's do some more naval invasions. There's a few places around here. Uh, let's navally invade Siak so they try to pull their troops back. I'm gonna go ahead and activate conscription in my capital as home defense. It's basically, just in case someone tries to do a sneaky little invasion, I'll have some conscription centers activated. Um, these won't be particularly good, but they'll be basic irregular troops who can hold the line. I could feed them materials, but I'm not going to. But just let them train up uh, a, a few conscripted battalions for the defense of Japan. So iron is relatively expensive right now. Can I do something about that? Let's have a look. Uh, we could upgrade to condensing engine pump, which should reduce the price of iron. Doesn't really take care of the coal situation. So what's coal? Shortage of 200. That means I would need five coal mines. So five coal mines it is to try to meet that shortage. I say shortage, it's more like a deficit. Like we don't have enough coal to cover all of the needs, so they're a little bit expensive. Okay, conquer uh, Maguinadao. Thankfully, we actually control our war goal in Macau. So this is going to make Portugal have a negative war exhaustion. Even if we can't push in, they're going to suffer negative war exhaustion, which means we will eventually win this. We will take Macau. They can't get fleets over here to take it back. Plus, I'm garrisoning it with a rather large force. And uh, we took a chunk of the Philippines. Now, I think eventually something we may want to do is to release Philippines as a country, as a vassal country. But for now, it's essentially a colony that we can, you know, use to generate resources, etc. Line goes up, baby. The more land we conquer, the more money we make, the more beautiful it is. Siak got war goals enforced in them, which means we broke that incredibly good general who is fighting in Portugal. So we got rid of him. Do some more naval invasions. There's only a couple of like tiny little pieces here. This is going to cripple Portugal because this um, Macau is actually like incredibly productive for Portugal because it's where they can get rice, they can get livestock, they can get tea, they can get tobacco. If you're playing as Portugal and you don't develop this piece of your empire, you're actually super messing up in my opinion because this thing is so valuable. These are all resources that Portugal cannot make in Europe. But yeah, basically there's three phases to a diplomatic play. There's the opening phase, then there is the count, uh, countdown to war. Uh, there's like opening, escalation, countdown to war, which is like at the very last second you can back down or you, you like things are happening. We're going to war. Huge. This is huge. Mutual funds have just been unlocked, which unlocks publicly traded for most of our things. Also 10% more intro, in, intro, uh, minting and less interest. So this is a big moment for Japan because now all of these privately owned textile mills can now be publicly traded, which will increase the quantity of capitalists that are employed by them. It will lower the profitability on a per capitalist basis, 
per capita, per capita, if you will. However, by massively increasing the quantity of capitalists in our country, we will massively increase their political pull. And so we're going to be switching basically every co company that I can to being publicly traded on a stock exchange so that we can start the capitalist revolution, baby. So now we can uh, publicly trade all of the um, wheat farms. Now, what's important about this is, right, this adds aristocrats, this adds capitalists. So if we look at the employment of this, bye bye, Mr. Aristocrat, you should go away now. And hello, capitalists. I think it might actually add more aristocrats. I'm not entirely sure how it works, but basically now capitalists will be employed on my farms, thus increasing the total amount of capitalists in my country. Yes, the ruling class, the new, the nouveau ruling class. So I've went through and completely switched my economy over to capitalism, being publicly traded. And that should mean when I look at this population screen, every single week that goes by, the total amount of capitalists in my country should start to shoot up, which will give them a ton, hopefully a ton of political power. Well, their political power went down because I think their quality of life is going down. 4.5 million, 4 million. So yeah, their wealth is going down, but their population is going up, I think. Three and a half million. So this is actually diluting the power of the capitalists. Interesting. Okay, that's not the effect I was expecting. But I think that's just because their quality of... Ah, they're still building up their quality of life in a lot of areas. I see. So it should be a temporary reduction in their political strength, but a long-term increase, hopefully. Yeah, now it's climbing back up as they get more wealthy. Excellent. So short term, this will hurt the political power of the industrialists. This will hopefully massively hurt the political power of everyone, except for the industrialists. And uh, Japan is about ready to do the honorable restoration. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I love you all very much. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye.